we did mention this um, this idea of like uh, uh, well, I'm going to introduce this concept of overarching egregores. So <laughs> we have Christianity, for example. Now I read somewhere once that there was something like apart from Catholicism, which literally means I believe universal. Um, yeah. You have this after the Reformation, you had all of these new schools of essentially open up, open up. One guy goes to a church, likes what the guy says and says, yeah, I like that, that and that, but sure. I like this thing. I'll go and set up my own one. Next right. thing you know, you've got something like 36 plus thousand branches, wherever that number comes from. I read it somewhere, but there's quite a few. I know this because there's a lot around where I am. There's lots of different ones, but sure. they, all have, they all have a central premise, which is Christ, essentially. And right. so now, even though they've all got their own little pockets uh, or sort of like um, specific, I guess, you know, they're all doing each little building you go to, they're all doing the same rituals, the same protocols, essentially, or seeing things the same way or generally have a shared view sure. of thing. But there are some clear delineations between them and their bros down the road, so to speak. And but um, so they've got their own little pockets. But they're also feeding into a central concept as well, which is strengthening the overall concept. Is there some correctness, do you think, in what I've just said there? Or? Oh, I, absolutely. Uh, what I would add is the main difference you're going to find is that, and this affects Protest Protestantism versus, say, Catholicism or Eastern Orthodox Christianity, is most of the Protestant systems do not have a direct connection to an apostolic line of secession. So they can't access things like the Latin Mass or some of the other rituals in, say, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And so those are where you get some differences and you get some kind of splinter egregores that are still co-associated with the overall theme. And this is true of any big egregore you get. I mean, I'm sure if somebody deep dove it enough, you'd notice the difference between the Diet Coke guys and the regular Coke guys. Mm. Now, again, that's not an esoteric egregore, so how you would apply that to something is, you know, somewhat curious. But that's very true what you pointed out, and it's just part of how these things function. So cults, for example, can be on the surface related to one religion or another, right? You see this a lot in ultra-Orthodox Judaism, where they've got all these little pockets, and you can only join them if you're from the right group of people and all this other kind of business. It's still Judaism at the end of the at the end of the day, but someone from another group can't access the rituals in a Gregory's associated with a different group. So again, all pointed in the same direction for the most part, but there are some distinct differences. And of course, you know, this has led to wars and all kinds of other stuff over the years as well. So it's just part of human nature, as far as I can tell, Phil. You know, there if you look back through early anthropological work, archaeological work, human beings sim seem to live in groups as small as 20 and not much bigger than about 200. That's physically what we're designed to interact with. And the military, U.S. military has done a lot of studies on this. And it shows your average person can only have an effective chain of command of four to six people. They can reach as high as seven or eight for short periods of time. But as individuals, we can only implicitly know four to six other people really well. Everyone else is on the periphery of that. So this is where you get command structures for, right? So... A squad's going to have four to six people in it. Then you kind of move up to a platoon with about 30, but you got a platoon sergeant and a bunch of squad leaders. Then you move up to a company of a couple hundred, which has a bunch of platoon leaders and so on and so forth. But they're all organized around this principle of each person in charge has four to six other people they're in charge of because that's the limit of what they can really handle. And so you see this in a lot of organizations that have grown where things start to break down. Because now you got 90 people in the group. Well, if you only got one guy in charge, there's no way for him to intuitively know all 90 people. So the people he's going to know better, that he works with all the time, and there's people that he doesn't know so well. Mm. And this is where you have to institute structure, hierarchy, if you will, to make the system work. So 
there's only one pope in Catholicism, right? Mm -hmm. How many cardinals, how many bishops, how many parish priests? These people are in the thousands, yeah. right? Because to structure everything leading towards that kind of common association, you have to have that hierarchy at a certain point. Otherwise, it just becomes too much. Yeah. Internal power practitioners, based off my experience of maybe 30 or 40 of these people over the years who I thought really had jam, are intuitively not opposed, but don't want to be associated with that. But by the same token, no individual practitioner can pull off the juice that a big ritual in a well-established lodge can pull off. Mm. It's just too many people. So, you know, it's, uh, it's curious to see how that plays out over and over again in terms of human affairs, whether it's the guy in charge of a hospital and then the business manager and all the section chiefs down in, you know, radiology and internal medicine and blah, blah, and so on and so forth. And then you get down to, you know, the individual doctors in there who are now in charge of the nursing staff and the orderlies and everybody else, because that's just the way it works. Um, so again, some people can push a little harder and expand that out a little more for limited periods of time, but generally that's how it works. Yeah, cool. Thank you for that. Um, now, uh, I had a question here uh, in regards to uh, hijacking infiltration of egregores and also about I, I, I'm going to just, I'll just read it out because I probably wrote it down better than I can just take, take it up sure. from my head. Can, can practices slash magicians assist with the correcting or improving of egregores? Presumably, IPS practitioners possess greater influence potential than the average person on the street, e.g. a practicer who is actively working mm -hmm. will likely have a an influence of, say, 20 um 20 plus arbitrary number non practices so if you've got high performing like um you know i mean if you've got actively practicing people in a group on one hand um you know they're going to be able to influence it more and it's their personality essentially i guess will feed into that too so if you're going to have powerful people you want to sure. have probably people who've done a bit of the, in the introspective type work and also i'm wondering about egregores like uh actively recruiting like you know like desirable members and things like that and you know uh so yeah any anything you can share on those things sure um one an active practitioner is going to bat above their weight that's for sure you know they're going to have more influence than a bunch of casual practitioners two it depends upon the system sometimes you can come in from the outside and leverage things other times you really can't just depends upon how the egregore is structured the protections around the rituals, but this kind of thing. You've also got the issue of what Stalin once said, that uh, mass has a quality all of its own, where quality is great. You know, take a guy like um, uh, uh, the famous MMA guy, uh, Pierre St. George, George, George St. Pierre, GSP. Yeah. As an individual fighter, he's phenomenal. Okay. You could probably take on two or three, maybe even four guys at a local gym and win. But when it's 20 on one, he's going to lose. Now, it might take him a while to lose, right? He's going to last longer. But at the end of the day, numbers swamp individual effort. So, yeah, you can influence Negregory if it's small enough as an individual. You can certainly get things out of it. But also keep in mind, the influence of an egregore cuts both ways. You influence it, it influences you. And so if you're trying to make a radical U-turn with something, if it's of any serious size, power, or consequence, yeah, you might be able to move it a few degrees here or there, right? But in the course of one lifetime and one man's effort, you're probably not going to make a U-turn with that. And that's the reason why some of these older, grungier egregores associated with, say, Mesoamerica, right? If you're dealing with an egregore that was actively involved in human sacrifice at an industrial level over a couple thousand year period, not saying you can't get good stuff out of it, 
but that's you're going to pay for that. So my favorite example involves Tibetan Buddhism. Everybody knows who Naropa is, right? You know, the, the creator of the six yogas of Naropa, the foundation of Tibetan Buddhism. What most people don't know is the story of Naropa's teacher, Tilopa. Okay. Tilopa was a magician, a yogi, but he was also a hustler and a pimp who was on the run in the Hindu Kush. Guy had a lot of bad habits. <laughs> yeah. Some of that stuff still haunts the system. You know, some of the karma mudra, mm. sacred sex kind of practices that can get a little weird. You know, that stuff's still out there. Why? Because the guy who actually created the system, Tilopa, Naropa's teacher, he was one of those freaky guys, man. You know, Tilopa liked to party. Hey, <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to be there. Yeah. yeah, so you see this in more modern things like the Thelemites. Aleister Crowley just had a bunch of bad habits, man. Now he got, he largely, according to popular thought, he largely got over those as he got older. All right. And this is a family friendly show, so I won't get too explicit, but, you know, between <laughs> the heroin use and the male prostitutes and, you know, all the other kind of stuff, if you're invoking, you know, the spirit of uh, Aleister Crowley through the rituals he created. Yeah, some of the weird behavior that goes on in some of those groups, not so surprising. And that's something relatively new, right? Where we can actually track back to go, yeah, this was the guy. Yeah. Some of these really old systems. Hey, listen, okay. People out there know about the living crystal device and, and the work that, you know, my private practice group did on that. Okay, fine. The entity we got that from was the Iranian, from Uranus spirit, okay, who was, yeah, who was a uh, supposedly an engineer and architect that built the original pyramids, okay. Mm. Pretty sure he was Phoenician, kind of hard to tell, okay. So blood magic was a big well, it's not know how big, but was a certainly a part of Phoenician practice, human sacrifice on a small scale, this kind of thing. So I'm sitting there having a conversation with Anthony one night about some different things involving the living crystal. He's like, oh, yeah, if you want to do that, go out and get six slaves. You know, this will be a little expensive. But just go get six slaves. You have to sacrifice them. You have to bleed them out this specific way. But it'll work for what you're doing. Okay. Uh, a, I'm not going to do that. B, I wouldn't know where to get six slaves even if I wanted to. <laughs> C, in our society, yeah, that's going to come with all kinds of problems associated with it. Mm. But for this entity, this was just part of its day-to-day, -day, man. It's yeah, the kind of thing yeah. it was involved with when it was incarnating physically. And so, again, you get involved with some of this older stuff, yeah, you might be able to clear it out a little bit. You know, if you're working at it mainly at the mental Akashic or non-dual levels, maybe not too bad. But if you're dealing with something that comes with a bunch of uh, not socially acceptable issues in a modern setting, you're probably not going to beat that one. That That's probably going to come through on some kind of level. You know, because again, a lot of these ancient mystery schools had a very different definition of acceptable risk. Okay. You know, ancient Egyptian acolytes swimming amongst crocodiles in the Nile. Well, some of those guys were going to get eaten. And they was like, all right, well, you know, shit happens. You know, I was part of one school once where the ultimate uh, initiation experience was something known as the struggle of fire and water. So you would have this event occur that would manifest where fire and water would be happening at the same time. And you kind of had to fight your way out of it. So in my case, it involved running nine miles through the open desert in the middle of a lightning storm. The lightning was striking so near to me, I could feel the heat coming off of it. Wow. Okay. Now I happened to survive that go team, but how many people didn't mm -hmm. don't know. You know, so again, 
the stuff is real. It's potent. You can learn a lot of important lessons from bad people, you know, as all of us have in life. I've studied with a couple of cult leaders who I could not recommend in clear conscience to anybody because the amount of effort I had to go through to learn things was just not worth the, worth the effort at the end of the day. But it's out there. I mean, hey, you know, it's, it's in theory, and, and this is what annoys me with a lot of, not a lot, but a few Barden practitioners I run into every, every once in a while, is if you ran into somebody who said, hey, man, I just bought a car. I don't know how to drive, but I'm going to figure it out. You would look at that person like they were insane. And maybe the car and they would survive learning how to drive the car all on their own. Mm. But, you know, having a driving instructor would probably be a good idea. <laughs> Take a few lessons, man. Uh, just try it out. You know, and so that's the trouble you can get into with a lot of this stuff. I mean, I've had a few, for lack of a better term, yogic injuries over the years where I tried to practice techniques that I learned purely from a meditative uh, standpoint, not from somebody telling me how to do it. And I paid for that in a few cases, you know, because it, I got hurt and there was nobody to talk to about how to fix it. You know, again, most kids, if you throw them in a lake, will dog paddle well enough so they don't drown. But if that kid wants to swim in the Olympics, you can bet he's going to need a coach, a trainer, a teacher, a whatever to get him to that point. And that's what we run into with a lot of esoterics that are discovered. The systems come with problems or things are missing or there's something about the practice that's not healthy for a lot of people, you know, and a lot of these older systems don't care. If you guys get crippled or hurt along the way or die, okay, you know, so always keep that in mind. Uh, if someone's trying to reform something, the links people will go to. And keep in mind, according to some people, Buddhism is nothing more than a reformed version of Hinduism. So you can look at the difficulties the Buddha went through to create what we now view as Buddhism out of what was there before. Okay. Keep in mind, the Buddha was not always this chubby old fat guy. He was Kateshvara. He grew up in warrior class. I'm sure they beat him like a monkey with a stick when he was growing up as a kid. He came out of a very harsh, very physical environment, but he wanted a better way to, for people to find enlightenment. As he said, hey, the way people are doing it right now either isn't working or has a lot of problems associated that we got to clean it up. And so, you know, and Egregore is forming around my approach to Kabbalah. It'll survive my death, I'm sure. Whereas previously it was a very clean system, but it was a very clean system because nobody was doing it. Mm. And even with me, I often wonder, why do I find Kabbalah so interesting? I'm a smart oh, guy. Right. I'm a motivated guy. I could do any number of things with this hours of day I spend on this. Why is this thing so interesting to me? Well, I like it. But here's the catch. If you're under the influence of an Egregore, how would you know the difference in the first place? And so there we have it. It's like, you know, I don't know why I'm attracted to this thing. Right. It keeps, I, I, I push it away and then it just keeps knocking. Like it's, it's still there. I mean, it, this is like with the, the energy healing thing. Personally, I'd rather just, I'm happy being a, a, a non-denominational energy healer. I like principle based approach. That's why when I found Mark Rasmus's material, I was like, oh man, th this guy is speaking a language that I just want to hang out with, man. Sure. And, and I've been so blessed because I've got a couple of his ex-students that, well, students and friends that live reasonably close with me. And oh. so, I've, yeah, yeah, very blessed. Unfortunately, trying to find a local practice partner is a whole nother conversation, but <laughs> such is life. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, um, th this is the thing is, is like, you know, when you're in the soup and you go, well, I mean, this is a natural inclination that I'm just following here. It's completely pure. Maybe it is. Right. I don't know why all these years I was I've been interested in studying Kabbalah for and it's many, many, many forms. Right. It's like right. going, is it like, hmm, what, you know, Kabbalah, you know, when I when I hear people talk about the Baden system, it's like, well, this is some pretty like uh, 
pri- these, these are like, like I kind of wonder, these are like primal building blocks or something like this, you know, yeah. like, uh, you know, and so, you know, this, this isn't made for immature people really. And I'm sure that it has mechanisms to that. But then on the flip side, like you said, some of these things are immoral too. They don't, they don't, they don't see the world like, you know, through the eyes of a human. And as I say this to my friends, I say, look, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go to a spiritual entity for uh, financial advice necessarily if they have, haven't had any experience on the physical plane because they just, what are they going to tell you, you know? And, and, and the New Agers make this mistake all the time. Listen, just because your Uncle Roger is dead doesn't make him any less of an idiot from when he was alive. <laughs> oh, yeah. If he was on the dole his whole life, smoking pot and drinking beer and beating his wife and kids on the couch when he's dead, he's the same guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he just doesn't yeah. have a body anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a great point to put. Yeah. Um, all right. Okay. I've got a couple of quick questions for you, brother, and sure. then we'll, um, we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Um, so um, these are quick fire ones. So um, what are some quick uh, do's and don'ts of egregores? Okay. Don't mix the metaphor. As Arnold Schwarzenegger often said, you have to learn the rules before you break the rules. So learn the rules first. If you're going to learn a system, learn the system. It's painful. It can take time, all this other kind of business. But it's like music. What's the difference between jazz and making noise? (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. There's a difference, and everybody knows what it is when they hear it. Yeah. But if you don't learn the chords and the scales and all that other kind of business... You're just making noise, banging on keys or banging on a drum or whatever. So learn the rules before you break them. If you're going to get involved with something, really learn it. Figure out what it's about before you start mixing it with other things. Because not all egregores are compatible. And sooner or later, you're going to have to choose. And if you haven't learned enough about one of them, maybe you're making the wrong choice. Good. Yeah, that's that's helpful. Yeah, I think too, like, you know... Um... Uh, some of the, uh, as a music teacher, I would take children through um, through learning a certain template of a song, right. and then we'd learn how to innovate and play within those parameters. Right. And then there they would have creativity that sort of flowered from having those skills, sort of thing. You know, they'd have some right. familiar things. So, uh, okay, here we go. Um, considerations for choosing an egregore to work with. Ultimately, is the goal of that egregore in line with your personal goals. If it is, great. So, you know, the medicine, Buddha, and doctors. Win-win, right? You become a better doctor by immersing yourself with that egregore. On the other hand, if you run off to medical school because everybody in your family is a doctor and you end up not being very good at it or hating it, but you keep doing it for the rest of your life because you don't have the energy left to learn how to do something new and you make a good living, that good living is going to come at the expense of your being miserable the entire time Mm -hmm. and probably not being a very good doctor. Mm -hmm. You know, again, when your goals are in line with that of the Gregore, fantastic. The second that ends, that's a problem. You know, so in the military, see this all the time. Guy serves 20, 30, 40 years, right? Great career, does wonderful things, really liked it. Well, at a certain point, unless you die on active duty, you know, in during duty, you have to leave. And a lot of guys who 10, 20, 30 years in never get over that. They're still in that mindset. They're still thinking that way. They're still acting that way. And that creates a lot of problems in their life. So, again... When the goals meet, it's great. But they may only meet for a certain period in time, and then you need to go do something else. Mm-hmm. And it'll suck because you're going to lose. Listen, when I left the uh, school, Black School of St. Cyprian, they had some amazing technology in that school that I can't access now. That was really disappointing. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, the direction that school was taking me, you know, Order of Melchizedek, this kind of thing, wasn't really what I was interested in. Hmm. And so while it was uncomfortable making that break, particularly because I'd made promises in that regard, it wasn't really hostile either. It was just, okay, different goals, different end states, got to do something else. And so that's 
where it gets hard because if you've learned the rules well enough to break them, right, walking away from that means you're going to be giving up some things that are actually useful. So. Hmm. Yeah, valuable. And, and just quickly on there, on compatibility of hmm. Gregors with each other, ones that play nicely with each other, I guess, uh, you know, um, I mean, I, I would assume that um, if two egregores, even though they might have, might come from that one comes from the east, one comes from the west, but they're both about like getting people to the top of the mountain, so to speak. And then they're like, right. okay, well, we can, I don't know, like, I mean, I, I'm only speculating here, but there's probably some like compromise or, you know, like right. handshakes that happen between them to go, okay, right. well, you know, they're two big players coming up against, but we see the potential in this individual. And so right. we want to help that. Uh, Buddhism and Christianity get along very well. Yeah, so I've heard this. Right, v very well. Um, Christianity and the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian stuff do not at all. Um, I have a suspicion that uh, Judaism and Tibetan Buddhism do not as well because there have been a few high-profile converts to Tibetan Buddhism out of uh, the Jewish community all of whom died from cancer at a very young age. So what, one of the Beastie Boys happened to be one of these. And I've heard similar stories within those communities. So again, not everything is compatible at the end of the day. Some things have a lot of baggage that come with them, particularly the more shamanic systems from martial arts and other things <clears throat> that ultimately, depending upon what you're working on, don't mesh very well. Can you have a one-to-one -one conversation with an egregore and sit him down and say, hey, look, man, yeah. this, I'm well, saying something else. This, the, uh, but, you know, are you cool with that? You can have a conversation with the entities associated with it. Right. Now, whether that's the guy in charge or not, man, who, you know, who the hell knows. Um, now, that's all going to be relative to your level of clairvoyance and clairaudience. Mm -hmm. So, again, that's a whole other skills developmental-based problem right there. But sometimes, yeah. You know, I've uh, I've uh, read about and been told by several people who've had some very interesting conversations with Lucifer mm. in terms of Luciferianism. Um, there's always some stuff underneath that that seems to be pretty negative, to be completely honest with you. And considering where that came from in Western culture, that's totally understandable. Um, but I've had people say they've actually had encounters with him. Um the uh, fictional magician, uh, not Harry Dresden, but but the other one, um, Keanu Reeves played the character in a film. Oh, Constantine. Constantine. There are people who have met Constantine physically, wow. in, including uh, um, a couple of the writers in the series. Um, so, you know, there you go, right? Now, what that Constantine thing is underneath it all, brother you, your guess is as good as mine mm. but yeah there have been people who indicated that they actually met these things not in the astral not in a vision not in a dream but actually right here in the here and now mm. Interesting. Yeah, i think that's uncommon i think you know spirit communication through meditation or mental wondering or astral projection is probably far more common but yeah there are personified versions of these things that given the right set of circumstances and the right skills that have been developed in a practitioner, sure, you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So how can one maximize their egregore-related activities? Now, we've probably mostly covered this, but essentially, if you sign up with it, you basically go, okay, I'm putting this on tracks and I'm going that way and I'm going to do all the things mm -hmm. and I'm going to wax and accessorize and I'm going to get the t-shirt and the hat and, and, and go and hang out with the teams and, and right. really get to know this thing. I, I presume that's yeah. something like that. Yeah. It, it's just immersing yourself into something as that thing is to be immersed in. Mm -hmm. So you want to be an SAS operator, right? You join the army, you go to selection, you get picked up, you do all the training. You're part of that community for years bang, you're part of it. You know, you want to be a great doctor. So you do the, med the, the medicine Buddha empowerment. <clears throat> you do all the prayers, you do all the offerings, you chant all the mantras, you go to all the ceremonies, you go to other groups of medicine Buddha practitioners, you practice medicine 
religiously, you do it with an open heart, you really commit yourself to it. Yeah, same deal. You know, and again, it's true if you want to be a CPA or a cop or a chef or a race car driver. Same deal. Well, brother, I have to say you've been extremely uh, generous with your time and thank you so much. I mean, I can talk about this stuff forever, to be honest, because it's just so interesting. And, you know, a man like yourself with the experience and the travels and that, you know, you bring uh, so much. I think, too, that one of the things I really like about your uh, presentation style is that you can make it very street level and relatable. And I think that in these times, um, you know, these practices uh, with people essentially like starting to scratch their heads a bit more about what to do. They got the finger stuck at their back backsides going, OK, well, AI has taken my job and I don't know what to do now. And some of them may be feeling some of them may be feeling called to sort of take up practices. It's like, going, well, there's actually real practices. And I think that just on that last question about, you know, like laser focusing on the on the critical path, essentially to the outcome. Sure. Like the problem that I've noticed, more well, problem, well, the thing I've noticed in a lot of sort of new agey kind of uh, sort of setups is it's very syncretic and they're just sort of yeah. tacking things together and and they're telling me about these experiences, but it's it's so spontaneous and sporadic and maybe a bit destabilizing as well for some. Whereas you know, like this, uh, you know, discovering this Barden system, which I mean, I've got a book on wizards, man, and it's got like it's like this thick, right? There's no sure. mention of Barden in there. Everyone else is in there except Barden. And it's like, oh, man, this is like the, the greatest secret of all, you know, like this particular book in some ways. It's it's interesting. But again, it's the things we commit to in life are the things that give us the most back. Hmm. There's no getting out of that. All right. In magicians, because they're largely solitary and blah, 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 blah tend to have a natural repellence towards that commitment process outside their own magic. And so, hey, man, you know, a wiser man than me said, you get what you give. Just make sure you're giving to someone in something that values what you're giving them. Mm, beautiful. And that you get something back out of it. Um, but that that's really... The truth at all. And again, people can go to 60skills.com and you know look at all my stuff or go to YouTube or whatever and hear about my various ramblings and ponderings on you know one issue or another. But ultimately, it was my time in the military, and I went to an engineering school for for college, for university, and I was a bad engineer, but school was free as long as I passed my classes, so I didn't quit. Mm -hmm. That gave a rigor to my line of thought mm -hmm. and my ability to go from A to B to C to what have you that a lot of people lack who don't come from an engineering based practice like playing music. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to learn your chords, got to learn scales, got to learn how to read the music, you got to learn how to do all this stuff to actually be a magician. Other, I'm oh, sorry, me a musician. Otherwise, you're just a performer, you know, banging on a drum on stage, jumping up and down like a, you know, well, like a weirdo because it's entertaining. But that's the difference between a performer and a musician. And, uh, you know, one of my, a landlord I had once, phenomenal man, um, classically trained pianist from a conservatory in Austria. Very precise, very focused. Told me this great story once about how you know, and this guy plays to high level political figures in the U S and all kinds yeah. of other hoity toity society, real musician, super strong worth that work ethic, you know, great guy. So, you know, he showed up one morning to his, uh, advisors, quite the right word or teacher, but anyway, one of the gentlemen at the school that was teaching him sat down at the piano. He'd had kind of a long weekend, so he hadn't really practiced and you know, his form was off. And he gets about five seconds into it and the guy, the old man comes up and just slams the cover down on the keyboard and goes, if you're not going to take this seriously, get the hell out of here. I get paid by the university. I don't care what happens to you. Well, that's how working with the Gregor Ores works. If you're really committed to whatever you're trying to do with it, you're going to get something out of it. Mm. Um, if you're not, well, you're going to get what you give. So, that's all I got, boss. 
Yeah, that's brilliant, man. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I think that principle of care, like how much you give a shit about something and how much you pour yourself into it, it's just going to amplify the, um, the, 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 the feedback and the rewards and the experiences yeah. that you have, you know, the more you put in. So, um, brother, thank you so much for your time. Uh, now, sure. of course, we want to do a dig for all of your uh, wares and things that you've got on look at these things so uh for obviously there's 60 skills.com i'll put it all in the description where sure. else can people find your goodies and bits and pieces the coursework is exclusively hosted by perseus arcane academy now mm -hmm. uh that that's managed uh overseas for me because i'm not the most tech savvy of individuals and if i was having to manage this it would be a complete donkey show so uh, I leave that up to the professionals. Um, obviously, there's the 60 Skills of Meditation channel on YouTube. There's the Facebook page for more current events and, you know, when I let people know about teachings. Uh, I play around a little bit with Odyssey, uh, TikTok, and um, Instagram. But honestly, 60skills.com, Precious Arcane Academy, uh, and the YouTube and Facebook pages are where you can find out all about all of the great 60 skills uh, developments. And yes, the planetary course will be out soon by the end of the month, finally. Uh, but I've been slacking on video production, so give me another week or so. Now, I just want to put another dig in for the uh, the book too. Initial Experiences with the Kabbalah. I own a copy of this on Kindle, and I refer to this regularly. It's an excellent supplement to the Barden book and any of the other commentaries that are out there. And um, it's also uh, your YouTube channel exposed me to this particular body of work as well. Dexheimer. Yep. Yeah. And I have to say that this has um, got, you know, I started working with the formulas and they're wow. Far out. I'm surprised at how quickly this stuff turns around, uh, you know, so I just want to drop that in there, but um, you know, um, <clears throat> The initial experiences with the Kabbalah, just to, specify, to focus on that for a moment, guys, uh, if you've started working on KDQ, I highly recommend this because Bob is very generous with sharing his personal experiences and some of the pitfalls, uh, potentially, maybe, uh, you know, there's things to watch out for. And um, there's a lot of stuff, obviously, the book itself, the Barden book, it's... Um, there's aspects of it which are, I don't think are quite complete and correct and cohesive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's things to be mindful of. And Bob points some of those things out in his book. So uh, with uh, Rod and Phobos, of course. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and, yeah, once again, thank you so much. And if I get to stay on for a couple of seconds more. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for, for, for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed this. And uh, we'll get this um, out very soon. Stay well. Thank uh, you.